section one of orpheus in mayfair and other stories and sketches this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis Orpheus in Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches by Maurice Baring Section 1 Orpheus in Mayfair Heraclius Themistocles Margaritas was a professional musician he was a singer and a composer of songs he wrote poetry in romaic and composed tunes to suit rhymes but it was not thus that he earned his daily bread and he was poor very poor to earn his livelihood he gave lessons music lessons during the day and in the evening lessons in greek ancient and modern to such people and these were rare who wished to learn these languages he was a young man only twenty-four and he had married before he came of age an italian girl called tina they had come to england in order to make their fortune they lived in apartments in the hereford road bayswater they had two children a little girl and a little boy they were very much in love with each other as happy as birds and as poor as church mice for heraclius themistocles got but few pupils and although he had sung in public at one or two concerts and had not been received unfavourably he failed to obtain engagements to sing in private houses which was his ambition he hoped by this means to become well known and then to be able to give recitals of his own where he would reveal to the world those tunes in which he knew the spirit of hellas breathed the whole desire of his life was to bring back and to give to the world the forgotten but undying song of greece in spite of this the modest advertisement which was to be found at concert agencies announcing that mr heraclius themistocles margaritas was willing to attend evening parties and to give an exhibition of greek music ancient and modern had as yet met with no response after he had been a year in england the only steps towards making a fortune were two public performances at charity matinees one or two pupils in pianoforte playing and an occasional but rare engagement for stray pupils at a school of modern languages it was in the middle of the second summer after his arrival that an incident occurred which proved to be the turning point of his career a london hostess was giving a party in honour of a foreign personage it had been intimated that some kind of music would be expected the hostess had neither the means nor the desire to secure for her entertainment stars of the first magnitude but she gathered together some lesser lights a violinist a pianist and a singer of french drawing-room melodies on the morning of the day on which her concert was to be given the hostess received a telegram from the singer of french drawing-room melodies to say that she had got a bad cold and could not possibly sing that night the hostess was in despair but a musical friend of hers came to the rescue and promised to obtain for her an excellent substitute a man who sang greek songs when margaritas received the telegram from arkwright's agency that he was to sing that night at a house he was overjoyed and could scarcely believe his eyes he at once communicated the news to tina and they spent hours in discussing what songs he should sing who the good fairy could have been who recommended him 
and in building castles in the air with regard to the result of this engagement he would become famous they would have enough money to go to italy for a holiday he would give concerts he would reveal to the modern world the music of hellas about half-past four in the afternoon margaritas went out to buy himself some respectable evening studs from a large emporium in the neighbourhood when he returned singing and whistling on the stairs for joy he was met by tina who to his astonishment was quite pale and he saw at a glance that something had happened they've put me off he said or it was a mistake i knew it was too good to be true it's not that said tina it's carlo carlo was their little boy who was nearly four years old what said margaritas tina dragged him into their little sitting-room he is ill she said very ill and i don't know what's the matter with him margaritas turned pale let me see him he said we must get a doctor the doctor is coming i went for him at once she said and then they walked on tiptoe into the bedroom where carlo was lying in his cot tossing about and evidently in a raging fever half an hour later the doctor came margaritas and tina waited silent and trembling with anxiety while he examined the child at last he came from the bedroom with a grave face he said that the child was very seriously ill but that if he got through the night he would very probably recover i must send a telegram said margaritas to tina i cannot possibly go tina squeezed his hand and then with a brave smile she went back to the sick-room margaritas took a telegraph form out of a shabby leather portfolio sat down before the dining-table on which the cloth had been laid for tea for the sitting-room was the dining-room also and wrote out the telegram and as he wrote his tears fell on the writing and smudged it his grief overcame him and he buried his face in his hands and sobbed what the fates give with one hand he thought to himself they take away with another then he heard himself he knew not why invoking the gods of greece the ancient gods of olympus to help him and at that moment the whole room seemed to be filled with a strange light and he saw the wonderful figure of a man with a shining face and eyes that seemed infinitely sad and at the same time infinitely luminous the figure held a lyre and said to him in greek it is well all will be well i will take your place at the concert when the vision had vanished the half-written telegram on his table had disappeared also the party at a house that night was brilliant rather than large in one of the drawing-rooms there was a piano in front of which were six or seven rows of gilt chairs the other rooms were filled with shifting groups of beautiful women and men wearing orders and medals there was a continuous buzz of conversation except in the room where the music was going on and even there in the background there was a subdued whispering the violinist was playing some elaborate nothings and displaying astounding facility but the audience did not seem to be much interested for when he stopped after some faint applause conversation broke loose like a torrent i do hope said some one to the lady next him that the music will be over soon one gets wedged in here one doesn't dare move and one had to put up with having one's conversation spoilt and interrupted it's an extraordinary thing 
answered the lady that nobody dares give a party in london without some kind of entertainment it is such a mistake at that moment the fourth and last item on the programme began which was called greek songs by heraclius themistocles margaritas he certainly looks like a greek said the lady who had been talking in fact if his hair was cut he would be quite good-looking it's not my idea of a greek whispered her neighbour he is too fair i thought greeks were dark hush said the lady and the first song began it was a strange thread of sound that came upon the ears of the listeners rather high and piercing and the accompaniment margaritas accompanied himself was twanging and monotonous like the sound of an indian tom-tom the same phrase was repeated two or three times over the melody seemed to consist of only a very few notes and to come over and over again with extraordinary persistence then the music rose into a high shrill call and ended abruptly what has happened asked the lady has he forgotten the words i think the song is over said the man that's one comfort at any rate i hate songs which i can't understand but their comments were stopped by the beginning of another song the second song was soft and very low and seemed to be almost entirely on one note it was still shorter than the first one and ended still more abruptly i don't believe he's a greek at all said the man his songs are just like the noise of bagpipes i dare say he's a scotch said the lady scotchmen are very clever but i must say his songs are short an indignant hush from a musician with long hair who was sitting not far off heralded the beginning of the third song it began on a high note clear and loud so that the audience was startled and for a moment or two there was not a whisper to be heard in the drawing-room then it died away in a piteous wail like the scream of a sea-bird and the high insistent note came back once more and this process seemed to be repeated several times till the sad scream prevailed and stopped suddenly a little desultory clapping was heard but it was instantly suppressed when the audience became aware that the song was not over he's going on again whispered the man a low long note was heard like the drone of a bee which went on sometimes rising and sometimes getting lower like a strange throbbing sob and then once more it ceased the audience hesitated a moment being not quite certain whether the music was really finished or not then when they saw margaritas rise from the piano some meagre well-bred applause was heard and an immense sigh of relief the people streamed into the other rooms and the conversation became loud and general the lady who had talked went quickly into the next room to find out what was the right thing to say about the music and if possible to get the opinion of a musician sir anthony holdsworth who had translated pindar was talking to ralph enderby who had written a book on modern greek folklore it hurts me said sir anthony to hear ancient greek pronounced like that it is impossible to distinguish the words besides which it's wrong to pronounce ancient greek like modern greek did you understand it no said ralph enderby i did not if it is modern greek it was certainly wrongly pronounced i think the man must be singing some kind of asiatic dialect unless he's a fraud hard by there was another group discussing the music blythe 
the musical critic and lawson who had the reputation of being a great connoisseur he's distinctly clever blythe was saying the songs are amusing pastiches of eastern folk song yes i think he's clever said lawson but there's nothing original in it and besides as i expect you noticed two of the songs were gross plagiarisms of debussy clever but not original said the lady to herself that's it and two hostesses who had overheard this conversation made up their minds to get margaritas for their parties for they scented the fact that he would ultimately be talked about but most of the people did not discuss the music at all as soon as the music had stopped james redaway who was a member of parliament left the house and went home he was engrossed in politics and had little time at his disposal for anything else as soon as he got home he went up to his wife's bedroom she had not been able to go to the party owing to a sudden attack of neuralgia she asked him to tell her all about it well he said there were the usual people there and there was some music some violin and piano playing to which i didn't listen after that a man sang some greek songs and a curious thing happened to me when it began i felt my head swimming and then i entirely lost account of my surroundings i forgot the party the drawing-room and the people and i seemed to be sitting on the rocks of a cliff near a small bay in front of me was the sea it was a kind of blue-green but far more blue or at least of quite a different kind of blue than any i have seen it was transparent and the sky above it was like a turquoise behind me the cliff merged into a hill which was covered with red and white flowers as bright as a persian carpet on the beach in front a tall man was standing wading in the water little bright waves sparkling round his feet he was tall and dark and he was spearing a lot of little silver fish which were lying on the sand with a small wooden trident and somewhere behind me a voice was singing i could not see where it came from but it was wonderfully soft and delicious and a lot of wild bees came swarming over the flowers and a green lizard came right up close to me and the air was burning hot and there was a smell of thyme and mint in it and then the song stopped and i came to myself and i was back again in the drawing-room then when the man began to sing again i again lost consciousness and i seemed to be in a dark orchard on a breathless summer night and somewhere near me there was a low white house with an opening which might have been a window shrouded by creepers and growing things and in it there was a faint light and from the house came the sound of a sad love song and although i had never heard the song before i understood it and it was about the moon and the pleiads having set and the hour passing and the voice sang but i sleep alone and this was repeated over and over again and it was the saddest and most beautiful thing i had ever heard and again it stopped and i was back again in the drawing-room then when the singer began his third song i felt cold all over and at the same time half suffocated as people say they feel when they are nearly drowning i realized that i was in a huge dark empty space and round me and far off in front of me were vague shadowy forms and in the distance there was something that looked like two tall thrones pillared and dim and on one of the thrones there was the dark form of a man and on the other a woman like a queen pale as marble and unreal as a ghost with great grey eyes that shone like moons in front of them was another form and he was singing a song and the song was so sad and so beautiful that tears rolled down the shadowy cheeks of the ghosts in front of me and all at once the singer gave a great 
cry of joy and something white and blinding flashed past me and disappeared and he with it but i remained in the same place with the dark ghosts far off in front of me and i seemed to be there an eternity till i heard a cry of desperate pain and anguish and the white form flashed past me once more and vanished and with it the whole thing and i was back again in the drawing-room and i felt faint and giddy and could not stay there any longer end of section one orpheus in mayfair Section 2 of Orpheus in Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Orpheus in Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches by Morris Baring Section 2 The Cricket Match an incident at a private school to winston churchill it was a saturday afternoon in june st james's school was playing a cricket match against chippenfields the whole school which consisted of forty boys with the exception of the eleven who were playing in the match were gathered together near the pavilion on the steep grassy bank which faced the cricket ground it was a swelteringly hot day. One of the masters was scoring in the pavilion. Two of the boys sat under the post and board, where the score was recorded in big white figures painted on the black squares. Most of the boys were sitting on the grass in front of the pavilion. St. James's won the toss and went in first. After scoring five for the first wicket, they collapsed. In an hour and five minutes their last wicket fell. They had only made twenty-seven runs. Fortune was against St. James's that day. Hitchens, their captain, in whom the school confidently trusted, was caught out in his first over, and Wormald and Bell Minor, their two best men, both failed to score. Then Chippenfields went in, St. James's fast bowlers, Blundell and Anderson Minor, seemed unable to do anything against the Chippenfields batsmen. The first wicket went down at seventy. The boys who were looking on grew listless. Three of them, Gordon, Smith and Hart Minor, wandered off from the pavilion, further up the slope of the hill, where there was a kind of wooden scaffolding raised for letting off fireworks on the 5th of November. The headmaster, who was a fanatical conservative, used to burn on that anniversary effigies of liberal politicians, such as Mr. Gladstone and Mr. Chamberlain, who was at that time a radical, while the boys, whose politics were conservative, and who formed the vast majority, cheered and kicked the liberals, of whom there were only eight. Smith, Gordon, and Hart Minor three little boys aged about eleven were in the third division of the school they were not in the eleven nor had they any hopes of ever attaining that glory which conferred the privilege of wearing white flannel instead of grey flannel trousers and a white flannel cap with a red maltese cross on it to tell the truth the spectacle of this seemingly endless game in which they did not have even the satisfaction of seeing their own side victorious, began to weigh on their spirits. They climbed up onto the wooden scaffolding and organized a game of their own, an utterly childish game, which consisted of one boy throwing some dried horse chestnuts from the top of the scaffolding into the mouth of the boy at the bottom. They soon became engrossed in their occupation, and were thoroughly enjoying themselves when one of the masters, Mr. Whitehead by name, came towards them 
with a face like thunder biting his knuckles, a thing which he did when he was very angry. "'Go indoors at once,' he said. "'Go up to the Third Division schoolroom and do two hours' work. You can copy out the Greek irregular verbs.' The boys, taken completely by surprise, but accepting this decree as they accepted everything else, because it never occurred to them it could be otherwise, trotted off, not very disconsolate, to the schoolroom. It was very hot out of doors. It was cool in the third division schoolroom. They got out their steel pens, their double-lined copy-books, and began mechanically copying out the Greek irregular verbs, with which they were so superficially familiar, and from which they were so fundamentally divorced. Whitey, said Gordon, was in an awful wax. I don't care, said Smith. I'd just as soon sit here as look on at that beastly match. But why, said Hart, have we got to do two hours' work? Oh, said Gordon. He's just in a wax, that's all. And the matter was not further discussed. At six o'clock the boys had tea. The cricket match had, of course, resulted in a crushing and overwhelming defeat for St. James's. The rival eleven had been asked to tea. There were cherries for tea in their honour. When Gordon Smith and Hart Minor entered the dining-room, they at once perceived that an atmosphere of gloom and menacing storm was overhanging the school. Their spirits had hitherto been unflagging. They sat next to each other at the tea-table, but no sooner had they sat down than they were seized by that terrible, uncomfortable feeling, so familiar to schoolboys, that something unpleasant was impending, some crime, some accusation, some doom, the nature of which they could not guess, was lying in ambush. This was written on the headmaster's face. The headmaster sat at a square table in the centre of the dining-room. The boys sat round on the further side of three tables, which formed the three sides of the square room. The meal passed in gloomy silence. Gordon, Smith, and Hart began a fitful conversation. But a message was immediately passed up to them from Mr. Whitehead, who sat at the bottom of one of the tables, to stop talking. At the end of tea, the guests filed out of the room. The headmaster stood up and rapped on his table with a knife. The whole school, he said, will come to the library in ten minutes' time. The boys left the dining room. They began to whisper to one another with bated breath. What's the matter? And the boys of the second division shook their heads ominously and pointing to Gordon, Smith, and Hart, said, "'You're in for it this time.' The boys of the first division were too important to take any notice of the rest of the school, and retired to the first division schoolroom in dignified silence. Ten minutes later the whole school was assembled in the library, from which one flight of stairs led to the upper stories. The staircase was shrouded from view by a dark curtain hanging from a Gothic arch. It was through this curtain that the headmaster used dramatically to appear on important occasions, and it was up this staircase that boys guilty of cardinal offences were led off to corporal punishment. The boys waited in breathless silence. Acute suspense was felt by the whole school, but by none so keenly as by Gordon, Smith, and Hart Minor. These three little boys felt perfectly sick with fear of the unknown, and the terror of having in some 
unknown way made themselves responsible for the calamity which would perhaps vitally affect the whole school. Presently a rustle was heard, and the headmaster swept down the staircase and through the curtain, robed in the black silk gown of an LLD. He stood at a high desk, which was placed opposite the staircase in front of the boys, who sat in order of their divisions on rows of chairs. The three assistant masters walked in from a side door, also in their gowns, and took seats to the right and left of the headmaster's desk. There was a breathless silence. The headmaster began to speak in grave and icily cold tones. His face was contracted by a permanent frown. I had thought, he said, that there were in this school some boys who had a notion of gentlemanly behaviour, manly conduct, and common decency. I see that I was mistaken. The behaviour of certain of you today, I will not mention them because of their exceeding shame, but you will all know whom I mean. At this moment all the boys turned round and looked hard at Gordon, Smith, and Hart Minor, who blushed scarlet and whose eyes filled with tears. "'The less said about the matter, the better,' continued the headmaster. "'But I confess that it is difficult for me to understand how any one, however young, can be so hardened and so wanton as to behave in the callous and indecent way in which certain of you, I need not mention who, have behaved today. You have disgraced the school in the eyes of strangers. You have violated the laws of hospitality and courtesy. You have shown that in St. James's there is not a gleam of patriotism not a spark of interest in the school, not a touch of that ordinary, common English manliness, that sense for the interests of the school and the community, which makes Englishmen what they are. The boys who have been most guilty in this matter have already been punished, and I do not propose to punish them further. But I had intended to take the whole school for an expedition to the New Forest next week. That expedition will be put off. In fact, it will never take place. Only the Eleven shall go. And I trust that at another time the miserable idlers and loafers who have brought this shame, this disgrace on the school, who have no self-respect and no self-control, who do not know how to behave like gentlemen, who are idle, vulgar, and depraved, will learn by this lesson to mend their ways, and to behave better in the future. But I am sorry to say that it is not only the chief offenders, who, as I have already said, have been punished, who are guilty in the matter. Many of the other boys, although they did not descend to the depths of vulgar behaviour reached by the culprits, I have mentioned, showed a considerable lack of patriotism by their apathy and their lack of attention while the cricket match was proceeding this afternoon. I can only hope this may be a lesson to you all. But while I trust the chief offenders will feel specially uncomfortable, I wish to impress upon you that you are all, with the exception of the eleven, in a sense guilty." With these words the headmaster swept out of the room. The boys dispersed in whispering groups. Gordon Smith and Hart Minor, when they attempted to speak, were met with stony silence. They were boycotted and cut by the remaining boys. 
Gordon and Smith slept in two adjoining cubicles, and in a third adjoining cubicle was an upper division boy called Worthing. That night, after they had gone to bed, Gordon asked Worthing whether among all the guilty one just man had not been found. Surely, he said, Campbell Minor, who put up the score during the cricket match, was attentive right through the game, and wouldn't he be allowed to go to the New Forest with the eleven? No, said Worthing. He whistled twice. Oh, said Gordon, I didn't know that. Of course he can't go. End of section two. Section three of Orpheus and Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emma Charlotte. Orpheus and Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches by Maurice Baring. The Shadow of a Midnight, a Ghost Story. It was nine o'clock in the evening. Sasha, the maid, had brought in the samovar and placed it at the head of the long table. Marie Nikolaevna, our hostess, poured out the tea. Her husband was playing vint with his daughter, the doctor, and his son-in-law in another corner of the room, and Jameson, who had just finished his Russian lesson, he was working for the civil service examination, was reading the last number of the Ruskaya Slova. "'Have you found anything interesting, Franz Franzovich?' said Marie Nikolaevna to Jameson, as she handed him a glass of tea. "'Yes, I have,' answered the Englishman, looking up. His eyes had a clear dreaminess about them, which generally belongs only to fanatics or visionaries and I had no reason to believe that Jameson, who seemed to be common sense personified, was either one or the other. At least, he continued, it interests me, and it's odd, very odd. What is it? asked Marie Nikolaevna. Well, to tell you what it is would mean a long story which you wouldn't believe, said Jameson. Only... It's odd, very odd. Tell us the story, I said. As you won't believe a word of it, Jameson repeated, it's not much use my telling it. We insisted on hearing the story, so Jameson lit a cigarette and began. Two years ago, he said, I was at Heidelberg, at the university, and I made friends with a young fellow called Brown. His parents were German, but he had lived five or six years in America, and he was practically an American. I made his acquaintance by chance at a lecture when I first arrived, and he helped me in a number of ways. He was an energetic and kind-hearted fellow, and we became great friends. He was a student, but he did not belong to any corpse or burschenschaft. He was working hard then. Afterwards, he became an engineer. When the summer semester came to an end, we both stayed on at Heidelberg. One day, Brown suggested that we should go for a walking tour and explore the country. I was only too pleased, and we started. It was glorious weather, and we enjoyed ourselves hugely. On the third night after we had started, we arrived at a village called Salzheim. It was a picturesque little place, and there was a curious old church in it with some interesting tombs and relics of the Thirty Years' War. But the inn where we put up the night was even more picturesque than the church. It had been a convent for nuns, only the greater part of it had been burnt, and only a quaint gabled house and a kind of tower covered with ivy which I suppose had once been the Balfrey, remained. We had an excellent supper and went to bed early. 
we had been given two bedrooms, which were airy and clean, and altogether we were satisfied. My bedroom opened into Brown's, which was beyond it, and had no other door of its own. It was a hot night in July, and Brown asked me to leave the door open. I did. We opened both the windows. Brown went to bed and fell asleep almost directly, for very soon I heard his snores. I had imagined that I was longing for sleep, but no sooner had I got into bed than all my sleepiness left me. This was odd, because we had walked a good many miles, and it had been a blazing hot day, and up till then I had slept like a log the moment I got into bed. I lit a candle and began reading a small volume of Hine I carried with me. I heard the clock strike ten, and then eleven, and still I felt that sleep was out of the question. I said to myself, I will read till twelve and then I will stop. My watch was on a chair by my bedside, and when the clock struck eleven I noticed that it was five minutes slow and set it right. I could see the church tower from my window, and every time the clock struck, and it struck the quarters, the noise boomed through the rooms. When the clock struck a quarter to twelve I yawned for the first time, and I felt thankful that sleep seemed at last to be coming to me. I left off reading, and taking my watch in my hand I waited for midnight to strike. The quarter of an hour seemed an eternity. At last the hands of my watch showed that it was one minute to twelve. I put out my candle and began counting sixty, waiting for the clock to strike. I had counted a hundred and sixty, and still the clock had not struck. I counted up to four hundred. Then I thought I must have made a mistake. I lit my candle again and looked at my watch. It was two minutes past twelve, and still the clock had not struck. A curious, uncomfortable feeling came over me, and I sat up in bed with my watch in my hand and longed to call Brown, who was peacefully snoring, but I did not like to. I sat like this till a quarter past twelve. The clock struck the quarter as usual. I made up my mind that the clock must have struck twelve, and that I must have slept for a minute. At the same time I knew I had not slept and I put out my candle. I must have fallen asleep almost directly. The next thing I remember was waking with a start. It seemed to me that someone had shut the door between my room and Brown's. I felt for the matches. The matchbox was empty. Up to that moment, I cannot tell why, something, an unaccountable dread, had prevented me looking at the door. I made an effort and looked. It was shut, and through the cracks and through the keyhole I saw the glimmer of a light. Brown had lit his candle. I called him, not very loudly. There was no answer. I called again more loudly. There was still no answer. Then I got out of bed and walked to the door. As I went, it was gently and slightly opened, just enough to show me a thin streak of light. At that moment I felt that someone was looking at me. Then it was instantly shut once more, as softly as it had been opened. There was not a sound to be heard. I walked on tiptoe towards the door but it seemed to me that I had taken a hundred years to cross the room, and when at last I reached the door I felt I could not open it. I was simply paralysed with fear, and still I saw the glimmer through the keyhole and the cracks. Suddenly, as I was standing transfixed with fright in front of the door, I heard sounds coming from Brown's room, a shuffle of footsteps, and voices talking low but distinctly in a language I could not understand. It was not Italian, Spanish, nor French. The voices grew all at once louder, 
I heard the noise of a struggle and a cry which ended in a stifled groan, very painful and horrible to hear. Then, whether I regained my self-control, or whether it was excess of fright which prompted me, I don't know, but I flew to the door and tried to open it. Someone or something was pressing with all its might against it. Then I screamed at the top of my voice, and as I screamed I heard the cock crow. The door gave, and I almost fell into Brown's room. It was quite dark. But Brown was waked by my screams and quietly lit a match. He asked me gently what on earth was the matter. The room was empty, and everything was in its place. Outside, the first greyness of dawn was in the sky. I said I had had a nightmare, and asked him if he had not had one as well. But Brown said he had never slept better in his life. The next day we went on with our walking tour, and when we got back to Heidelberg, Brown sailed for America. I never saw him again, although we corresponded frequently. And only last week I had a letter from him, dated Nizhny Novgorod, saying he would be at Moscow before the end of the month. And now I suppose you are all wondering what this can have to do with anything that's in the newspaper. Well, listen. And he read out the following paragraph from the Ruskaya Slova. Samara, 2-9. In the centre of the town, in the hotel... A band of armed swindlers attacked a German engineer named Brown and demanded money. On his refusal, one of the robbers stabbed Brown with a knife. The robbers, taking the money which was on him, amounting to 500 rubles, got away. Brown called for assistance, but died of his wounds in the night. It appears that he had met the swindlers at a restaurant. Since I have been in Russia... Jameson added. I have often thought that I knew what language it was that was talked behind the door that night in the inn at Salzheim. But now I know it was Russian. End of section three. Section four of Orpheus in Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Orpheus in Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches by Maurice Baring. Section 4. Jean-François. Jean-François. Jean-François was a vagabond by nature, a balladmonger by profession. Like many poets in many times, he found that the business of writing verse was more amusing than lucrative, and he was constrained to supplement the earnings of his pen and his guitar by other and more profitable work. He had run away from what had been his home at the age of seven, he was a foundling and his adopted father was a shoemaker, without having learnt a trade. When the necessity arose, he decided to supplement the art of ballad mongering by that of stealing. He was skilful in both arts. He wrote verse, sang ballads, picked pockets in the city, and stole horses in the country with equal facility and success. Some of his verse has reached posterity. For instance, the Ballade du Paradis Pain, which he wrote on white vellum and illustrated himself with illuminations in red, blue, and gold for the Dauphin. It ends thus in the English version of a Balliol scholar. Prince, do not let your nose, your royal nose, your large imperial nose get out of joint. Forbear to criticise my perfect prose. Painting on vellum is my weakest point. Again, the ballade of which the envoi runs. Prince, when you light your pipe with radium spills, especially invented for the king, remember this. The worst of human ills, life without matches, is a dismal thing. Is, in reality, only a feeble adaptation of his Prier pour feu le vrai trésor de vie. 
But although Jean-François was not unknown during his lifetime, and although, as his verse testifies, he knew his name would live among those of the enduring poets after his death, his life was one of rough hardship, brief pleasures, long anxieties, and constant uncertainty. Sometimes, for a few days at a time, he would live in riotous luxury, but these rare epochs would immediately be succeeded by periods of want bordering on starvation, besides which he was nearly always in peril of his life. The shadow of the gallows darkened his merriment, and the thought of the wheel made bitter his joy. Yet, in spite of this hazardous and harassing life, in spite of the sharp and sudden transitions in his career, in spite of the menace of doom, the hint of the wheel and the gallows, his fund of joy remained undiminished. And this we see in his verse, which reflects with equal vividness his alternate moods of infinite enjoyment and unmitigated despair. For instance, the only two triolets which have survived from his trente-deux triolets joyeux et tristes are an example of his twofold temperament. They run thus in the literal and exact translations of them made by an eminent official. I wish I was dead and lay deep in the grave. I've a pain in my head. I wish I was dead. In a coffin of lead with the wise and the brave. I wish I was dead and lay deep in the grave. This passionate utterance immediately preceded in the original text the following verses in which his buoyant spirits rise once more to the surface. Thank God I'm alive in the light of the sun. It's a quarter to five. Thank God I'm alive. Now the hum of the hive of the world has begun. Thank God I'm alive in the light of the sun. A more plaintive, in fact, a positively wistful note which is almost incongruous amongst the definite and sharply defined moods of Jean-François, is struck in the sonnet of which only the first line has reached us. I wish I had a hundred thousand pounds. Volontiers serait pauvre avec dix mille escus. But in nearly all his verse, whether joyous as in the Chant de Vin et Vie, or gloomy as in the Ballade des Treize Pendus, there is a curious recurrent aspiration towards a warm fire, a sure and plentiful supper, a clean bed and a long, long sleep. Whether Jean-François moped or made merry, and in spite of the fact that he enjoyed his roving career and would not have exchanged it for the throne of an emperor or the money-bags of Croesus, there is no doubt that he experienced the burden of an immense fatigue. He was never quite warm enough, always a little hungry, and never got as much sleep as he desired. A place where he could sleep his fill represented the highest joys of heaven to him, and he looked forward to death as a traveller looks forward to a warm inn where, its terrible threshold once passed, a man can sleep the clock round. Witness the sonnet which ends, the translation is mine, for thou hast never turned a stranger from thy gates, or hast denied, O hospitable death, a place to rest. And it is of his death, and not of his life or works, which I wish to tell, for it was singular. He died on Christmas Eve, 1432. The winter that year in the north of France was, as is well known, terrible for its severe cold. The rich stayed at home, the poor died, and the unfortunate third estate of gypsies, balladmongers, tinkers, tumblers, and thieves had no chance of displaying their dexterity. In fact, they starved. Ever since the 1st of December, Jean-François had been unable to make a silver penny, either by his song or his sleight of hand. Christmas was drawing near, and he was starving, and this was especially bitter to him as it was his custom, for he was not only a lover of good cheer, but a good Catholic and a strict observer of fasts and feasts, to keep the great day of Christendom fittingly. This year he had nothing to keep it with. Luck seemed to be against him. For three days before Christmas he met in a dark side street of the town 
the rich and stingy Sieur de Ranquet. He picked the pocket of that nobleman, but owing to the extreme cold, his fingers faltered and he was discovered. He ran like a hare and managed easily enough to outstrip the miser and to conceal himself in a den where he was well known. But unfortunately, the matter did not end there. The Sieur de Ranquet was influential at court. He was implacable as well as avaricious, and his disposition positively forbade him to forgive any one who had nearly picked his pocket. Besides which, he knew that Jean had often stolen his horses. He made a formal complaint at high quarters, and a warrant was issued against Jean, offering a large sum in silver coin to the man who should bring him, alive or dead, to justice. Now the police were keenly anxious to make an end of Jean. They knew he was guilty of a hundred thefts, but such was his skill that they had never been able to convict him. He had often been put in prison, but he had always been released for want of evidence. This time, no mistake was possible. So Jean, aware of the danger, fled from the city and sought a gypsy encampment in a neighbouring forest where he had friends. These gypsy friends of his were robbers, outlaws, murderers and horse-stealers, all of them, and hardened criminals. They called themselves gypsies, but it was merely a courtesy title. On Christmas Eve, it was snowing hard, Jean was walking through the forest towards the town, ready for a desperate venture, for in the camp they were starving and he was sick almost to death of his hunted, miserable life. As he plunged through the snow, he heard a moan, and he saw a child sitting at the roots of a tall tree, crying. He asked what was the matter. The child, it was a little boy about five years old, said that it had run away from home because its nurse had beaten it and had lost its way. "'Where do you live?' asked Jean. "'My father is the Sieur de Ranquet,' said the child. At that moment, Jean heard the shouts of his companions in the distance. "'I want to go home,' said the little boy quietly. "'You must take me home.' And he put his hand into Jean's hand and looked up at him and smiled. Jean thought for a moment. The boy was richly dressed. He had a large ruby cross hanging from a golden collar worth many hundred gold pieces. Jean knew well what would happen if his gypsy companions came across the child. They would kill it instantly. All right, said Jean. Climb on my back. The little boy climbed onto his back and Jean trudged through the snow. In an hour's time they reached the Sieur de Ranquet's castle. The place was alive with bustling men and flaring torches, for the sieur's heir had been missed. The sieur looked at Jean and recognized him immediately. Jean was a public character, and especially well known to the sieur de Ranquet. A few words were whispered. The child was sent to bed, and the archers civilly led Jean to his dungeon. Jean was tired and sleepy. He fell asleep at once on the straw. They told him he would have to get up early the next morning in time for a long, cold journey. The gallows, they added, would be ready. But in the night, Jean dreamt a dream. He saw a child in glittering clothes and with a shining face who came into the dungeon and broke the bars. The child said, I am little St. Nicholas, the children's friend, and I think you are tired, so I am going to take you to a quiet place. Jean followed the child, who led him by the hand, till they came to a nice inn, very high up on the top of huge mountains. There was a blazing log fire in the room, a clean warm bed, and the windows opened on a range of snowy mountains, bright as diamonds and the stars twinkled in the sky like the candles of a Christmas tree. "'You can go to bed here,' said St. Nicholas. "'Nobody will disturb you, and when you do wake, you will be quite happy and rested. Good night, Jean.' And he went away. The next day in the dawn, when the archers came to fetch Jean, they found he was fast asleep, 
they thought it was almost a pity to wake him because he looked so happy and contented in his sleep but when they tried they found it was impossible end of section four recording by ulrike denis section five of orpheus in mayfair and other stories and sketches this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Orpheus in Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches by Maurice Baring Section 5 The Flute of Chang Lang To P. Kershaw The village was called Mo Tung. It was on the edge of the big main road which leads from Liaoyang to Ta Shai Chao. It consisted of a few baked mud houses, a dilapidated temple, a wall, a clump of willows, and a pond. One of the houses I knew well. In its square open yard, in which the rude furniture of toil lay strewn about, I had halted more than once for my midday meal, when riding from Liaoyang to the south. I had been entertained there by the owner of the house a brawny husbandman and his fat brown children, and they had given me eggs and Indian corn. Now it was empty. The house was deserted. The owner, his wife and his children, had all gone to the city, probably to seek shelter. We occupied the house, and the Cossacks at once made a fire with the front door and any fragments of wood they could find. The house was converted into a stable and a kitchen, and the officers' quarters were established in another smaller building across the road, on the edge of a great plain, which was bright green with the standing giant millet. This smaller cottage had an uncultivated garden in front of it, and a kind of natural summer-house made by the twining of a pumpkin plant which spread its broad leaves over some stakes. We lay down to rest in this garden. About five miles to the north of us was the town of Liao Yang. To the east, in the distance, was a range of pale blue hills, and immediately in front of us to the south, and scarcely a mile off, was the big hill of Shu Shantz. It was five o'clock in the afternoon, and we had been on the move since two o'clock in the morning. The Cossacks brought us tea and pancakes and presently news came from the town that the big battle would be fought the next day. The big battle, the real battle, which had been expected for so long, and which had been constantly put off. There was a complete stillness everywhere. The officers unpacked their valises and their camp beds. Everyone arranged his beds and his goods in his chosen place and it seemed as if we had merely begun once more to settle down for a further period of siesta in the long picnic which had been going on for the last two months. Nobody was convinced, in spite of the authentic news which we had received, that the Japanese would attack the next day. The sunset faded into a twilight of delicious summer calm. From the hills in the east came the noise of a few shots fired by the batteries there, and a captive balloon soared slowly, like a soap-bubble, into the eastern sky. I walked into the village. Here and there fires were burning, and I was attracted by the sight of the deserted temple in which the wooden painted gods were grinning, bereft of their priest and of their accustomed dues. I sat down on the mossy steps of the little wooden temple, and somewhere, either from one of the knolls hard by, or from one of the houses, came the sound of a flute, or rather, of some primitive wooden pipe, which repeated, over and over again, a monotonous and piercingly sad little tune. I wondered whether it was one of the soldiers playing, but I decided this could not be the case, as the tune was more eastern than any Russian tune. On the other hand, 
it seemed strange that any Chinaman should be about. The tune continued to break the perfect stillness with its iterated sadness, and a vague recollection came into my mind of a Chinese legend or poem I had read long ago in London about a flute player called Chang Lang. But I could not bring my memory to work. Its tired wheels all seemed to be buzzing feebly in different directions, and my thoughts came like thistledown and seemed to elude all efforts of concentration. And so I capitulated utterly to my drowsiness and fell asleep as I sat on the steps of the temple. I thought I had been sleeping for a long time and had woken before the dawn. The earth was misty, although the moon was shining, and I was no longer in the temple, but back once more at the edge of the plain. They must have fetched me back while I slept, I thought to myself. But when I looked round, I saw no trace of the officers, nor of the Cossacks, nor of the small house and the garden. And stranger still, the millet had been reaped, and the plain was covered with low stubble, and on it were pitched some curiously shaped tents, which I saw were guarded by soldiers. But these soldiers were Chinamen, and yet unlike any Chinaman I had ever seen, for some of them carried halberds, the double-armed halberds of the period of Charles I, and others halberds with a crescent on one side, like those which were used in the days of Henry the Seventh, And I then noticed that a whole multitude of soldiers were lying asleep on the ground, armed with two-edged swords and bows and arrows, and their clothes seemed unfamiliar and brighter than the clothes which Chinese soldiers wear nowadays. As I wondered what all this meant, a note of music came stealing through the night, and at first it seemed to be the same tune as I heard in the temple before I dropped off to sleep. But presently I was sure that this was a mistake, for the sound was richer and more mellow, and like that of a bell, only of an enchanted bell, such as that which is fabled to sound beneath the ocean. And the music seemed to rise and fall, to grow clear and full, and just as it was floating nearer and nearer, it died away in a sigh. But as it did so, the distant hills seemed to catch it, and to send it back in the company of a thousand echoes, till the whole night was filled and trembling with an unearthly chorus. The sleeping soldiers gradually stirred, and sat listening spellbound to the music, and in the eyes of the sentries, who were standing as motionless as bronze statues in front of the tents, I could see the tears glistening, and the whole of the sleeping army awoke from its slumber and listened to the strange sound. From the tents came men in glittering silks, the generals, I supposed, and listened also. The soldiers looked at each other and said no word, and then all at once, as though obeying some silent word of command, given by some unseen captain, one by one they walked away over the plain, leaving their tents behind them. They all marched off into the east, as if they were following the music into the heart of the hills, and soon, of all that great army which had been gathered together on the plain, not one man was left. Then the music changed, and seemed to grow different and more familiar and with a start I became aware that I had been asleep and dreaming, and that I was sitting on the temple steps once more in the twilight, and that not far off round a fire some soldiers were singing. It was a dream, and my sleep could not have been a long one, for it was still twilight and the darkness had not yet come. Fully awake now, I remembered clearly the old legend which had haunted me, and had taken shape in my dream. It was that of an army which on the night before the battle had heard the flute of Chang Lang. By his playing he had brought before the rude soldiers the far-off scenes of their childhood, 
which they had not looked upon for years. The sights and sounds of their homes, the faces and the spots which were familiar to them and dear. And they, as they heard this music, and felt these memories well up in their hearts, were seized with a longing and a desire for home, so potent and so imperative, that one by one they left the battlefield in silence. And when the enemy came at the dawn, they found the plain deserted and empty, for in one minute the flute of Chang Lang had stolen the hearts of eight thousand men. And I felt certain that I had heard the flute of Chang Lang this night, and that the soldiers had heard it too. For now, round a fire, a group of them were listening to the song of one of their comrades, a man from the south, who was singing of the quiet waters of the Don, and of a Cossack who had come back to his native land after many days, and found his true love wedded to another. I felt it was the flute of Chang Lang which had prompted the southerner to sing, and without doubt the men saw before them the great moon shining over the broad village street in the dark July and August nights, and heard the noise of dancing and song and the cheerful rhythmic accompaniment of the concertina. Or, if they came from the south, they saw the smiling thatched farms, whitewashed or painted in light green distemper, with vines growing on their walls. Or again, they felt the smell of the bean-fields in June, and saw in their mind's eye the panorama of the melting snows, when at a fairy touch the long winter is defeated, the meadows are flooded, and the trees seem to float about in the shining water, like shapes invoked by a wizard. They saw these things, and yearned towards them with all their hearts, here in this uncouth country, where they were to fight a strange people for some unaccountable reason. But Chang Lang had played his flute to them in vain. It was in vain that he had tried to lure them back to their homes, and in vain that he had melted their hearts with the memories of their childhood. For the battle began at dawn the next morning, and when the enemy attacked they found an army there to meet them, and the battle lasted for two days on this very spot. And many of the men to whom Chang Lang had brought back, through his flute, the sights and the sounds of their childhood, were fated never to hear again those familiar sounds, nor to see the land and the faces which they loved. End of section 5Section 6 of Orpheus in Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Orpheus in Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches by Maurice Baring what is truth to e i huber sitting opposite me in the second-class carriage of the express train which was crawling at a leisurely pace from moscow to the south was a little girl who looked as if she were about twelve years old with her mother the mother was a large fair-haired person with a good-natured expression they had a dog with them and the little girl, whose whole face twitched every now and then from St. Vitus's dance, got out at nearly every station to buy food for the dog. On the same side of the carriage, in the opposite corner, another lady, thin, fair, and wearing a pinch-nez, was reading the newspaper. She and the mother of the child soon made friends over the dog that is to say the dog made friends with the strange lady and was reproved by its mistress and the strange lady said please don't scold him he is not in the least in my way and i like dogs 
they then began to talk the large lady was going to the country she and her daughter had been ordered to go there by the doctor she had spent six weeks in moscow under medical treatment and they had now been told to finish this cure with a thorough rest in the country air the thin lady asked her the name of her doctor and before ascertaining what was the disease in question recommended another doctor who had cured a friend of hers almost as though by miracle of heart disease the large lady seemed interested and wrote down the direction of the marvellous physician she was herself suffering she said from a nervous illness and her daughter had st vitus's dance they were so far quite satisfied with their doctor they talked for some time exclusively about medical matters comparing notes about doctors diseases and remedies the thin lady said she had been cured of all her ills by aspirin and cinnamon in the course of the conversation the stout lady mentioned her husband who it turned out was the head of the gendarmerie in a town in siberia not far from irkutsk this seemed to interest the thin lady immensely she had at once asked what were his political views and what she herself thought about politics the large lady seemed to be reluctant to talk politics and evaded the questions for some time but after much desultory conversation which always came back to the same point she said my husband is a conservative they call him a black hundred but it's most unfair and untrue because he is a very good man and very just he has his own opinions and he is sincere he does not believe in the revolution or in the revolutionaries he took the oath to serve the emperor when everything went quietly and well and now although i have often begged him to leave the service he says it would be very wrong to leave just because it is dangerous i have taken the oath he says and i must keep it here she stopped but after some further questions on the part of the thin lady she said i never had time or leisure to think of these questions i was married when i was sixteen i have had eight children and they all died one after the other except this one who was the eldest i used to see political exiles and prisoners and i used to feel sympathy for them i used to hear about people being sent here and there and sometimes i used to go down on my knees to my husband to do what he could for them but i never thought about there being any particular idea at the back of all this then after a short pause she added it first dawned on me at moscow it was after the big strike and i was on my way home i had been staying with some friends in the country and i happened by chance to see the funeral of that man bowman the doctor who was killed i was very much impressed when i saw that huge procession go past all the men singing the funeral march and i understood that bowman himself had nothing to do with it who cared about bowman but i understood that he was a symbol i saw that there must be a big idea which moves all these people to give up everything to go to prison to kill and be killed i understood this for the first time at that funeral i cried when the crowd went past i understood there was a big idea a great cause behind it all then i went home there were disorders in siberia you know in siberia we are much freer than you are there is only one society the officials the political people revolutionaries exiles everybody in fact all meet constantly i used to go to political meetings and to see and talk with the liberal and revolutionary leaders then i began to be disappointed 
because what had always struck me as unjust was that one man just because he happened to be say ivan pavlovitch should be able to rule over another man who happened to be say ivan ivanovitch and now that these republics were being made it seemed that the same thing was beginning all over again that all the places of authority were being seized and dealt out amongst another lot of people who were behaving exactly like those who had authority before the arbitrary authority was there just the same only it had changed hands and this puzzled me very much and i began to ask myself where is the truth what did your husband think asked the thin lady my husband did not like to talk about these things she answered he says i am in the service and i have to serve it is not my business to have opinions but all those republics didn't last very long rejoined the thin lady no continued the other we never had a republic and after a time they arrested the chief agitator who was the soul of the revolutionary movement in our town a wonderful orator i had heard him speak several times and been carried away when he was arrested i saw him taken to prison and he said good-bye to the people and bowed to them in the street in such an exaggerated theatrical way that i was astonished and felt uncomfortable here i thought is a man who can sacrifice himself for an idea and who seemed to be thoroughly sincere and yet he behaves theatrically and poses as if he were not sincere i felt more puzzled than ever and i asked my husband to let me go and see him in prison i thought that perhaps after talking to him i could solve the riddle and find out once and for all who was right and who was wrong my husband let me go and i was admitted into his cell you know who i am i said since i am here and i am admitted inside these locked doors he nodded then i asked him whether i could be of any use to him he said that he had all that he wanted and like this the ice was broken and i asked him presently if he believed in the whole movement he said that until the seventeenth of october when the manifesto had been issued he had believed with all his soul in it but the events of the last months had caused him to change his mind he now thought that the work of his party and in fact the whole movement which had been going on for over fifty years had really been in vain we shall have he said to begin again from the very beginning because the russian people are not ready for us yet and probably another fifty years will have to go by before they are ready i left him very much perplexed he was set free not long afterwards in virtue of some manifesto and because there had been no disorders in our town and he had not been the cause of any bloodshed soon after he came out of prison my husband met him and he said to my husband i suppose you will not shake hands with me and my husband replied because our views are different there is no reason why both of us should not be honest men and he shook hands with him the conversation now became a discussion about the various ideals of various people and parties holding different political views the large lady kept on expressing the puzzled state of mind in which she was the whole conversation of which i have given a very condensed report was spread over a long time and often interrupted later they reached the subject of political assassination and the large lady said about two months after i came home that year one day when i was out driving with my daughter in a sledge the revolutionaries fired six shots at us from revolvers we were not hit but one bullet went through the coachman's cap ever since then i have had nervous 
fits and my daughter has had st vitus's dance we have to go to moscow every year to be treated and it is so difficult i don't know how to manage when i am at home i feel as if i ought to go and when i am away i never have a moment's peace because i cannot help thinking the whole time that my husband is in danger a few weeks after they shot at us i met some of the revolutionary party at a meeting and i asked them why they had shot at myself and my daughter i could have understood it if they had shot at my husband but why at us he said when the wood is cut down the chips fly about a russian proverb and now i don't know what to think about it all sometimes i think it is all a mistake and i feel that the revolutionaries are posing and playing a part and that so soon as they get the upper hand they will be as bad as what we have now and then i say to myself all the same they are acting in a cause and it is a great cause and they are working for liberty and for the people and then would the people be better off if they had their way the more i think of it the more puzzled i am who is right is my husband right are they right is it a great cause how can they be wrong if they are imprisoned and killed for what they believe where is the truth and what is truth end of section six